The whole story of Acts is a story of the church. It's really quite an adventure, isn't it? If you think back to the beginning of Acts when at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit falls on the only believers in the world, 120 of them. Uh, God's Spirit descends on them. They speak the wonders of God with great power, and thousands are coming to Christ. The church is exploding, but it's a local movement. It's in Jerusalem. And then there's persecution from Jews, Jewish leaders, and they, they disperse. They spread throughout Judea and the Mediterranean world, and they take the gospel message with them, and the thing begins to grow. Churches are popping up all over the place, and the gospel is spreading. We've been looking at those stories. And now we begin the last series in our year-long study of Acts, The Reaching Adventure, Shipwrecks, riots and prison. That's a weird title, isn't it? But the last uh, eight chapters or so of the book of Acts are full of these radical things happening, which are all part of the movement called the church. It's easy for us not to, to miss this, but as, as suburbanites living in the tri-cities attending church today, we can miss the fact that we're part of that adventure. Whether God calls you to sell all your possessions and move to Ecuador or live radically for him in your business and your home right where you are. We are part of this movement of God's spirit among his people, which started back in the first century. And that's what we've been studying this, this whole year. The story we're going to examine comes to us uh, from Acts chapter 20. It's part of what those who study the New Testament call Paul's third missionary journey. The third major trip he, he took to spread the gospel. Um, and uh, if you notice, you open your Bibles to Acts 20, verse 16. This will not be on the screen, but it's a good starting point for us. Uh, next week, we're kind of out of order here a little bit, but next week you'll hear about what happened before this account in Acts 20. In verse 16, Paul had decided not to sail past Ephesus so he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Paul's going to, he's going to move on past Ephesus to get to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. However, in chapter 19, Paul's in Ephesus and a riot has broken out and he's at the center of it. So maybe he's in a hurry, but he also is thinking, I don't want another riot, so I'm not going to stop in Ephesus. But he does have a very deep desire to talk with, to share his heart with the Christians in Ephesus, particularly the leaders of the church. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to Acts 20. We're going to read verses 17 through the end of the chapter, verse 38. Now from Miletus... He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to, to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, Remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give and to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all, because the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. This is Paul's famous farewell to the Ephesians speech. 
It's, uh, it's often used as sort of a model for ministry. When I was in seminary at graduate school, this was the, one of the texts that was held up as, this is how a, a good minister of the gospel should behave. And there's lots of commandments and examples he gives in there. And I think that's true. But I also think that this text has more to say than just advice for pastors or ministers or leaders. I think we could ask the question, what kind of church are we supposed to be? What kind of life are we supposed to live together as God's people and get an answer to that or an insight to that by examining this text. Now, a little context here. Ephesus, the place where this takes place or near, lies about 10 kilometers, 6 miles or so from the coast. You look at the map there, hopefully on the far left you see Asia. Right below Asia you see Ephesus and Miletus below it. Uh, that's where Paul stopped in Miletus. And he calls from Miletus to Ephesus for the elders of the church to stop by. So he's on his way to Jerusalem sailing, and he thinks, I don't want to stop by there. Last time I did, there was a riot, and I need to get to Jerusalem, but I can't just sail on by. I, I have to speak to these people. So he stops in Miletus, the port city. That's the port city today. That's not the first century AD. That's not Paul's ship there. You know, the apostle, he, he rolled in style, right? <laughs> so so uh, you know, six miles or so for them to come on foot to meet him, because he has to talk to them. He has to share his heart with them, and he does so. How much did Paul love these people that he would do that? Read Ephesians chapter 1, which is written after these things. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for and remember you in all my prayers. Paul knows he's not going to see them. He says that in verse 25. God's made it clear. Last time, I'm never going to see you again. But he can't pass by without sharing his heart with them. And we should be glad that he did because there's a lot for us here in this text. Let's look at what he has to say. The first thing, kind of an overarching theme in Paul's farewell speech is that he kind of gives the reason, the purpose for his, him visiting them at all in the first place. The reason I was ever with you, like the driving force for me coming here in the first place was the truth, the message of God. It, it wasn't Ephesus, the great city, and, and I, it wasn't tourism. It wasn't, and the reason he said I, I, I was ever with you at all was because of the, I was compelled by the truth, the message. In fact, in verse 20, he says, I did not shrink back from declaring to you these things. In verse 27, I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. In other words, the reason I came to you at all is because of the truth of God, what we call the gospel. This message compelled me to come to you. The message compels, propels the mission. Now, we talk a lot around here about serve the world. We should. Yesterday after, or morning, in early afternoon, there were many of you serving in what we call Buddy Break, a ministry to children of special needs and their families. We do a lot of things to serve our community. And I'm, we should be grateful that God has blessed us in doing more of that. However, why do we do that? Just to be another humanitarian effort in the world? Another place where people can get food or clothing? or No. It's because of the message. It's because of the truth. That's what makes it distinct, our service. It's propelled and compelled by the gospel. Gospel service and otherwise. It's not just to feed hungry or just to clothe the people who, are, who, are un, who need it or just to give housing or just to give care. It's to do that in the name of Christ because of his love and to share his truth. Paul says the whole point of me coming to you was because of this message. That's what's bound us together. Here's the question then. Does the power of the gospel compel you does the power of the truth of God's word ever feel, do you ever feel compelled by it? Like, I have to share this. Or do you feel a little nervous about it? Like, I ought to, but I'm kind of, I don't like doing it. I'm not very good at it. Do you notice Paul uses this phrase twice? I did not shrink back. Do you notice that? I did not withhold anything. I did not shrink back. Why would he say it that way? Well, I think it's a natural human thing to shrink back, isn't it? To, to, to pause, to think, uh, how will this sound? Will they be offended? Paul says, I, I wasn't worried about that. I was compelled by the message. I did not shrink back from sharing with you anything that God had for you. You ever shrink back? I have. I'm a pastor, right? I shouldn't, but I have. I can remember vividly, not long ago, being in a restaurant, and you know, you, you have casual conversations with your servers, and sometimes I just wish they would not talk to me, just bring my food, because I have business to attend to, right? You know, so. But she came over and asked how we're doing. I said, how are you doing? And she actually started to talk about it. 
And it's not been a very good weekend. And she talked about some stuff in her life. And she said, I've been praying. I thought, this is an open door. I don't know if she, who she prays to or a believer. I mean, I felt like this is an open door to talk to her about her life. She's open to the door. And I didn't. I just ordered my chicken. You know, I shrunk back. You ever do that? In all, in your, in people at work or in your neighbors or friends feel like there's an opportunity. Maybe you see it in hindsight or maybe you, you just, uh, uh, and you shrink back. Paul says, that was, I, I didn't do that. I was compelled by this message, this truth. And I think part of the reason we shrink back is because the truth is, in our culture, the gospel sometimes is offensive to people. And that's not just new today, by the way. That's always been the case. We've seen it in our study of Acts. Some mock, some reject, some believe. It's always been that way. In fact, one of the symbols of the truth of the message is that some people are offended by it in all cultures. Not all people everywhere, but some people at all times are offended by it. It transcends culture. In fact, Timothy Keller in his book, Counterfeit Gods, he, he, he's quoting Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to Jews and it's foolishness to Greeks, meaning it's offensiveness to different groups for different reasons. And he says, that's interesting. You'll notice when you look at a historical study, a cultural study throughout history, the gospel has always been offensive in different times and in different cultures for different reasons. Here's his point. Let's take a Middle Eastern culture. Shame and honor culture. In that culture, the, the gospel ethic of sexual, sexual purity and monogamy and family is not offensive. It fits right in with their value system. But the gospel ethic of forgiving your enemies, loving those who persecute you, turning the other cheek, that makes no sense in a shame and honor culture. Now, in our culture, Western postmodern culture, forgiving your enemies, loving others, Turning the other cheek, that, that, we, don't, we like that. that. That fits in our culture of tolerance and acceptance. But the sexual ethic, the family value, that's increasingly offensive in our culture. His point is the gospel message transcends human culture. It's not bound by it. And it will always have a hard edge. And there will always be a part of us that wants to shrink back from declaring all of it, to soften it, to make it a little easier to swallow or not to say it at all. And Paul said, I didn't do that with you. I shared it all with you, and you've been changed because of it. So do we shrink back from time to time? Sometimes in the pulpit even, I'm tempted to shrink back. Well, I don't want to say it that way. They may not like it. Well, too bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Notice in, verse, in the second half of verse 20, Paul says, I declared this to you publicly and from house to house. Now, I had not noticed this or really thought about it much before. I think I noticed it, but I hadn't really pondered what the meaning there is. He says, I declare the truth of God to you both in public, in large group settings. We've read about Paul, right? Being in the, air, in the Agora, in the Areopagus, out in the marketplace, sh proclaiming the gospel. But he also says, I did it house to house. What does he mean? He says, this truth that's been the reason I came to you, I declared to you not just from a lofty perch or in the synagogue or in the market, but in your own home, face to face, life to life. And I think truth must be shared in both ways, don't you? I've talked to lots of people who have heard a message from me or Pastor Brian or others and been inspired. God's planted some seed, but it doesn't take root. It doesn't grow. It doesn't produce fruit in their life unless it's house to house, face to face, life to life. The only time you're getting a dose of God's truth is once a week on Sunday where you sit and face forward and then go home and forget about it. It's not enough. It needs to be in our homes, in our lives, in our relationships as well. And Paul says, we had both. He also says, I declared it to you what was profitable or helpful, meaning he's not just railing against them for being sinful and wrong. He's saying things for their good to help them. So we need truth, not just in the big gatherings. And for you, for those in your life that you want to share the message of the gospel with, I know sometimes you'll hand them a CD or you'll give them a link to listen to this message or invite them to big gatherings. Wonderful, good, you should do that. But what about house to house? Face to face? Life to life? You talking about the grace of God in your life with that person? 
There's just no substitute for truth in the context of a relationship. Truth declared and truth shared. Truth proclaimed and personalized. So that's the first thing is the truth. Is Paul is there because of the truth of God. Now, the, the second thing I want to point out here is that he says, I was with you in, in two places. He uses this word, I was with you in tears. Notice in verse uh, 20, or in 21, excuse me. Actually, I'm sorry, verse 19. Serving the Lord with humility, with all tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. In verse 27, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And later on, he says, I share these things with you with great tears. What does he mean by tears? Was Paul just kind of a weepy guy? He's a very emotional man. He cried a lot, you know. What's he saying there? What's the point of this? I think truth and tears go together in a powerful way that we see here in the text. Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, I did not come to you with words of human wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross be emptied of its power, but I came to you in weakness and in humility and in tears. Paul says, he, you know how I was. And the first thing he says is, you know how I was when I was with you, when I lived among you, meaning they have a shared life together. And he says, in tears, in humility and in tears. He was vulnerable with them. They saw him not just at his best, but at his worst. And like in our age of social media, right, you can, you can tweet an image of yourself. I, my, my daughter is flying back today from Virginia. She's played in a, in a basketball tournament out in Virginia this weekend. And I notice on, on her, her team's Twitter account, they only post uh, when they win. They only post pictures of them when they, when they win. I have to call my wife. I didn't see a tweet. What happened? Oh, we lost. You know, right? You can control the message. You take a selfie. That's not very good. My, doesn't, my beard doesn't look good that way. Right? You get the right one. You put it on the, on the way you want it. You craft the message. You can, you, can, you can put out an image of yourself. Now, I'm not against social media. I think Christians should be engaged in it and using it to proclaim the gospel. However, it's a controlled image you put out there, Right? You can, you can craft the message and, and how it looks and sounds. You, you front out an image that may not be accurate, but when you sit with somebody face to face, across the table from them, it's harder to pretend. You can read their body language. You can see how it's going. You can talk to them and get a sense of what their life is really like. I'll never forget, years ago, I was in the East Campus, uh, and I was walking through the lobby, and I saw a guy that I knew. I had his kids in youth ministry. I knew him a little bit. We were, we were not deep friends, but acquaintances. And I said, hey, how's it going? And like he stopped, just stopped. And he, and he went, you really want to know? Now, I, I actually didn't really want to know. I was kind of in a hurry. You know, I just said that because that's what you say, right? I'm like, but you can't, if someone says that, you can't say, no, no, I don't want to know. Right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, tell me. And he goes on to talk about brokenness in his marriage. How he thinks his wife is about to leave. How he's estranged from a couple of his kids. Just pain in his life. And he goes, you know, man, I'm just sick of pretending. And I just decided I'm not going to lie anymore. The next person that asks me, I'm going to tell him, sorry, dude, it just happened to be you. <laughs> you know? But it made me think, how many people are doing that here this morning? I'm fine. Everything's good. Paul says, I wasn't just among you as one who pretended everything's okay. You didn't just see me at my best, you know. You saw me at my worst. In tears. In vulnerability. In brokenness. And, and by the way, where do we see the truth of someone's faith? Where do you get a better picture of, of the reality of someone's faith in God when everything's going great or in tears and in pain? Now that runs co countercultural to, to, to our society, even in, in, in certain Christian circles, right? Look how successful my life is. Look how good things are going for me, how much God is blessing me. Therefore, believe in my God. With no apologies to those of you who like Joel Olstein. I mean it. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm just saying he's up there. His hair is awesome, right? <laughs> it's a nice spinning glow behind him, and his wife looks like a Barbie doll, and he's saying, God wants to bless you. He just wants you to be blessed, 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 right? You know? Now, now, I do believe God wants to bless us. I believe that. Scripture says that. I do believe we can call out to God for healing, and he wants to do good things in our lives. But if that's his major agenda, then how come all those who follow Jesus so closely end up dead in bad ways? Paul says, I'm not, I'm not one among you who's just preaching from a lofty perch, just showing you the glitz and the glitter, the polished self. I'm among you broken, cried with you. 
sit with you in your pain and you in mine. You've seen the truth of what I proclaim to you up close, even in my pain. That's how you know, he's saying. Power and tears, truth and tears, publicly and house to house. I think you have to have both. I'll never forget Kim McCart's funeral. Many of you know Kim and knew her and loved her. She was a dear member of our church and, and, and dear friend of mine. First person ever to volunteer with me when I came here 16 years ago as a youth pastor. And she died of brain cancer all too soon. And I remember at her funeral, her niece got up to speak and share. And I don't remember everything she said, but it made an impact on me. Her niece is a striking, tall, blonde young woman who's like a fitness model or something. I don't remember exactly what she did, but it looked like she was. And she, she said... Um, I, I love my Aunt Kim. She's always joyful and gracious and kind and generous. If you knew Kim, she, that's who she was. She said, but I really didn't have much time for her God or the faith of her family. I was living my own life, my own way. And she said, I, I contracted pneumonia and I had a bad breakup and I couldn't go on this photo shoot. And she says, I, I sunk into kind of a depression and my, I felt like my life was in a pit and nobody could kind of cheer me up or get me out of this. I was miserable. And she said, then it dawned on me that my happiness crumbled in an instant when, when I didn't feel well and things didn't go well. But my Aunt Kim has had brain cancer for over two years. Chemotherapy, radiation, the whole bit. And she's never ceased to be the same loving, joyful, generous, gracious person she was before she got sick. And she said, it dawned on me, what I thought I had is false. It was based on circumstances. What she has is real. How did she know it was real? She knew it in her suffering. She knew it in her tears. She knew it in her pain, not just when all was good. Paul's saying, I was among you as one who, who cried with you, with humility and tears. And if you think about it, this is, the, this is the heart of the gospel message, isn't it? How does God, when he looks down and sees a broken, sinful world that's rejected him and wandering and lost, does he come in a show of power? All must kneel, right? I mean, he will come back someday that way. But how does he come? How does the gospel come? In weakness, in vulnerability, in humility, and Jesus wept in tears. That's what Paul's saying to us here. And I think sometimes we separate those things. They have to go together, truth and tears. In our lives and in our church, we need both. Now let's look at what that produces then. Look at verse 36 and 37 with me. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and kissed him. Why focus on that? These folks are not just acquaintances. They're not just surface-level friends. There's a deep connection here. These are men kissing each other because of the gospel. I remember when I was in Russia many years ago uh, as a group from our church helping our sister church uh, in Samara, Russia, celebrate their 100-year anniversary. They'd outlived communism, and I got to go over with a group from our church to help them celebrate and to bless them. And when we were all done with the celebrations, we were there for about a week and uh, did some preaching through an interpreter, and it was just really a privilege for me to be part of it. And we're leaving. Uh, they threw us a banquet, you know, the farewell. And we gave a little farewell speech, and they said things to us. And as we're departing, we're like shaking hands and embracing. And there's a little old man, Brother Benjamin, at the end of the row, a little old shriveled Russian man. I mean, like he looked like a tiny wrinkled guy down there. And he reached up and he grabbed me around the neck like this and pulled me down. He was remarkably strong for a wrinkled old Russian man. And he was going like this. Mm -mm. And I'm, I'm like, oh, Russian men in the church kiss each other on the lips. I did not know this at the time. And he's pulling me down. His face is getting closer. And I turned like he got me like right there at the last second, you know. You have anybody you love that much? Turn to your neighbor. <laughs> if you're new, you're like, what is this? They do this? No, no. Uh, the point I want to make here is that the powerful truth of God's love for us, the message of the cross, the gospel, shared not just in strength but in weakness and tears, produces a depth of relationship that nothing else can come close to. Now, I think in the church today, myself included, we sometimes suffer from a surface relationship. We come and we nod pleasantly at each other. Oh, I think I know that guy. Oh, he lives down the street. My kids play together. We don't share really the deep conviction, even in the brokenness. 
C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, talks about true friendship. And he uses four different Greek words for love. Uh, eros, uh, romantic love. Phileo, where Philadelphia comes from, the city of brotherly love. Human friendship love. He writes this. Those who cannot conceive of friendship as a true love betray the fact they've never had a real friend. The rest of us know that though we can have erotic love and friendship for the same person, yet in some ways nothing is less like friendship than a love affair. Lovers are always talking to one another about their love. Friends hardly ever talk about their friendship. Isn't that true? Back when you were dating, you talk about defining the relationship, right? Talk about us and our relationship, right? But when you're friends, you don't say, how's our friendship going? You're just friends. He says, lovers are normally face-to-face -face absorbed in each other, right? You're so beautiful. You're not so bad yourself, right? We stare at each other, and we're absorbed in each other. Lewis says, friends are not face-to-face. -face. They're shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder looking in the same direction, specifically looking at the same truth that they both share and glory in. Paul says, the cross. What binds us together is the truth shared in tears. We stand shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder, staring in the same direction, gazing on the same Lord. That's what makes our connection deeper than any other human affection. And Lewis goes on, the very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where the truthful answer to the question, do you see the same truth as me, would be I don't. I don't care about the truth. I only want a friend. No real friendship can arise. There would be nothing for the friendship to be about. And friendship must be about something even if it were only enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. I don't know why he chose that, right? It has to be about something. We have to share something. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers, Lewis writes. I think he's right. So Paul's saying, you know how we share this. You've seen it in my life, I've seen it in yours. And in verse 32, he says, Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. That's what they share. That's what we share. And then finally, in uh, Acts 20, verse 22, Paul says he's resolved or compelled to go to Jerusalem. And we know that Luke wrote Acts. And in Luke's own gospel, chapter 9, verse 51, he says Jesus resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem. The same Greek construction. Paul set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. He wants us to see a comparison there. They are both compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem with one tremendous difference. Paul went with friends. He's got a shipload of them. On board the boat, they're his friends. They're going with him, many of them. Jesus went alone. One by one, his friends would desert him, right up to the point where he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The message of the gospel is that the God of the universe, truth incarnate, came into the world in weakness and in humility and in tears, lived a, sinful life, a sinless life for sinful people, and went to the cross alone, was friendless. Why? So that Jesus could say in John 15, I no longer call you servants, but friends. So that you and I could be brought in and called his friends and made true friends of each other. He's the friend in Proverbs who sticks closer than a brother. That's the truth that we share. That's the truth that we proclaim. Publicly and house to house. In power and in tears. Let's stand together for closing prayer. We don't have a closing song this morning. We're going to pray and then I'll dismiss you. But after I pray, if you'd like someone to pray with you personally, feel free to come forward at the close of the service. Members of the prayer team would love to meet you and encourage you through prayer in any way that they can. Let's bow together. Father, we thank and praise you for the message of the gospel. It is what we share. It is why we exist. It is what this church is to be built on in our lives as well. Open our hearts and our minds to it, to you and to each other that we might, as your sons and daughters, stand shoulder to shoulder, staring at your glory, now and for all eternity. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And go in peace.